Hey there, everybody. Just a reminder, before we get into the episode to send us your questions, comments, thoughts on your favorite episodes and feedback for our upcoming mailbag episode, send those to withpod at gmail.com or tweet us with the hashtag withpod. We should note this episode was recorded June 15th. Our lives are, in fact, held up by this invisible scaffolding, and there's all these stories underneath that we're going to pull out and show to the audience. That's part of it. That's sort of like the candy part of it. And then the vegetables part of it is that, you know, we live in a time when people have lost faith in their government, and they treat their government like they have a relationship of consumers to their government, where they they want the government to provide them with services, and they're angry when they don't receive it. And we've lost sight of it as a common project that we are all engaged in as a society. And somewhat with good reason, because of the way that the, you know, the government has been deliberately eroded by forces working within it and outside of it to reduce that faith. Hello, and welcome to Why Is This Happening? With me, your host, Chris Hayes. Do you get the sense these days that feels like lots of things don't work well and (laughs) lots of things are broken or disrupted and that is frustrating and a bummer? And I think it's easy in these times to lose sight of all the things that do work or things that are running in the background. And that was something that, that I think the pandemic because it was such a severe disruption, it did remind us of all of the like processes that function underneath our normal life. Some of those are market processes, right? So we don't think about the supply chain for toilet paper as a daily thing. It just sort of happens in the background. There's, I don't know, someone makes toilet paper, someone buys it, someone ships it, shows up in the store, you buy it, right? But it turns out that, you know, if you disrupt that supply chain, that you have shortages, right? And there's something similar, I think, with a lot of the stuff that government does, you know, government does so many things at so many different levels that it's just easy to for it all to be invisible. I mean, to me, the ultimate example of this is traffic lights, right? Like, if a traffic light is broken, you really notice. <laughs> and, you know, all of a sudden an intersection becomes dangerous or it becomes a site of, tra- of a huge traffic jam. But, you know, I live in New York City. Like, there's a lot of traffic lights and, you know, 99.99% of them work. Which is more than I could say for the light bulbs in my own house, for sure. Like, there are definitely more light bulbs out in my own house than there are traffic lights out. And someone is monitoring to make sure that those traffic lights work, going to replace them when they don't, you know, in a very timely fashion to make sure that, like, this very basic function of government gets done. And that's true, like, up and down the line where government failure is just way more visible than government success. Because so often government success is just producing the kind of framework for other people to do what they need or want to do to flourish, right? So the traffic lights working mean that you can get to work on time or you can go pick up your kid or wherever you're going. If it doesn't work, then you notice it. And that, I think, is part of the reason that People think the government sucks (laughs) because they tend to just notice it when it's not working, which, again, happens a lot. Like, there's lots of things government screws up. There's lots of places where government is, quote unquote, the problem. But it's only because of the invisibility of the functioning of the good parts. Now, that key insight formed the basis for a fantastic book called The Fifth Risk by Michael Lewis. And we actually had him on the podcast to discuss it where he sort of gets into the guts of what the government does, why it's so important, and how the Trump administration was, like, egregiously careless with those functions. The podcast host, TV star, investigative comedian Adam Conover read that book and was like, oh, this is cool, and has kind of through a fascinating process that involves both Barack Obama and Netflix, which we'll get into, like, made a TV show about that basic idea. It's called The G Word. It's on Netflix. It's out now. It's sort of inspired, loosely based on The Fifth Risk by Michael Lewis. A real kind of fascinating, really entertaining, really funny investigation of like what the federal government in particular does and doesn't do and how it does it and why it's so important that it does the things it does and does those things well. I thought it would be a fantastic opportunity to talk about both that topic and also Adam's career and trajectory and what it's like to work with Barack and Michelle Obama. So, Adam, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thank you so much for having me, Chris. It's a thrill to be here. As a listener of the show, it's a thrill to be on the show. Oh, well, that's great. I'm a factually listener, too, and uh, I I love Adam Ruins Everything, and... 
Let's start with that. What was your trajectory? At some point, Adam Ruins Everything was one of those cultural products that people, A, talked to me about, and B, like clips of it started floating into my <laughs> awareness. You know how that happens? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, ah, good, it worked. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's the way all, all, you know, the kismet of the algorithm. But, you know, people were sharing it, and and I, I was like, wow, this is really smart and really funny and also kind of like really sort of genre-defying in a way that I find fascinating and really admire. So- mm. What were you doing before then? Like, how did you come to do, <laughs> carve out this very cool niche that you've carved out? I really appreciate the kind words. I mean, the story was I, you know, was in the trenches as a comic in New York City for 10 years. I started at the very early beginning of the web video boom. I've been through multiple booms and busts of, you know, internet comedy in my life, directly preceding Adam Ruins Everything. I was a, a sketch writer at the comedy website College Humor. And my job was writing two sketches a week. And eventually, well, actually what happened was I was also simultaneously doing stand-up comedy. And, you know, the question quickly becomes when you're doing stand-up comedy, you're like, okay, I figured out how to make the audience laugh. How do I make them remember me? How do I give them something else in addition to a joke that is going to make them want to come see me again or make them take notice? And I started, I've always been an information sponge for this kind of information. I started just sharing that in my act. And when I did... I noticed people would lean forward a little bit. They'd pay a little bit more attention. The the first story I told was about how the the diamond engagement ring is a marketing creation that has infected our culture to such a degree they don't even need to advertise anymore. Everyone just buys the rings. And people were fascinated by that story. They started paying more attention to it. That was in your stand-up act. That was in my stand-up act. I literally just did two minutes two or three minutes about that on stage. And people would come up after me to, to me after the show and say, oh my God, is that true? Oh, I looked that up. That's crazy. You know? And so then I wrote a sketch about that for College Humor and that did well. And then I did a couple more. Uh, we came up with the title, Adam Ruins Everything. And then, you know, at the time, College Humor was looking to pitch television series. And so we adapted it into a television show and managed to pitch it to, you know, we pitched it all around. True TV happened to be wanting to compete with Comedy Central and wanting to make informational comedy. That was just sort of an idea they had in their heads. And so they bought it. And, you know, we also were simultaneously reposting all the clips on College Humor, which is how you, uh, on our YouTube channel, which is how you ended up seeing them. So I often sort of feel that like I'm jumping from one last media sinking ship to another, that I was on, <laughs> you know, internet-based sketch comedy at the very last moment, jump to basic cable just as that ship was sinking, have a new show premiering on Netflix just as Netflix is posting its first losses ever, right? And the entire streaming business is being reconsidered. I'm looking forward to seeing what sinking ship I can jump onto next with my career. But I've, I've sort of built this... Yeah, this thing of of informational comedy. Well, yeah. you but but the thing is, you have you've invested all your money in crypto, so you're good. I mean, you're, you'll, <laughs> you you should be good on that on that front. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm I haven't checked the markets lately, but I'm pretty sure I'm doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like it's funny with comedians, like stand up comedians. Is it me or do stand up comedians start doing stand up comedy like preposterously early? I feel like everyone in stand up comedy like knows they want to be a comic early, and people are like, well, I started working the clubs at 16 or 17. Like that's true of. It's true of like Eddie Murphy, it's true of Chris Rock, it's true of Pete Davidson, it's true of Louis yeah. C.K. Like all these people just start really early. How did you start doing that? Well, some of the people you're talking about are prodigies, right? Chris Rock was a prodigy. Someone right. like Michael Che is a prodigy. And, uh, you know, I remember doing comedy. I was doing stand-up for two years and Michael Che was, you know, skyrocketing. And people were like, he's only been doing comedy two years. And I was like, I'm, I've been doing comedy two years and I'm not on SNL. What's going on? You know, but so, so there are exceptions like that. I started doing comedy in college. I discovered that stand-up was my main love in comedy a, a little bit later when I, when I was in New York in my mid-20s. My story was I started a a sketch comedy group in college that in the very early internet, pre-YouTube, we started getting some heat. And then that was enough for us to to move to New York and start trying to do comedy professionally. But the truth is, you know, the reason people have to start early is it takes a good, you know, five to 10 years of doing it for free in basements before you can even make 50 bucks, you know, for doing a show. So yeah, there's a lot of grinding out to it just to learn how to do it. It's an unfortunate truth of the uh, comedy labor market in America is that it requires a whole lot of free labor. Well, and there's also a lot of method and craft development. I mean, there's sort of a 10,000 oh, yeah. hours thing happening there. Oh, 100%. Yeah, like Adam ruins everything in this show too. You know, and this was true. It's true of John Oliver, who's who I just profoundly admire and think is great. It's, yeah. it, was, it was true of Colbert and true of John Stewart. It's like, you know- all of that stuff, the kind of informational comedy, if you want to call it that, right? Mm-hmm. The you gotta 
do the comedy. <laughs> and yes. I don't do that. I, I just do the information part of it. But that means that my audience, I think, is, is narrower. Um, I think it, it sort of reaches less people. But I'm curious about, like, what did you learn about the craft in that period that the, you transfer to this kind of storytelling? Oh, that's a really good question. I've, I've never been asked that before. I mean, you learn how to write a joke. You learn how to deliver a joke. You learn how to make something that is not funny on the face of it funny. You know, you, you sort of build all of these tools very deeply into yourself so that you can just sort of use them as second nature when you're actually doing the work. Like what I often say in our writer's rooms is that the comedy for us is actually the easy part. The hard part is the information, you know? I mean, look, I, I admire what you do because you're up there breaking down very dense, complex information on a daily basis and digesting it and giving it to the audience. That is in itself very difficult, just finding the story and in the information, yeah. you know? Then, and making the argument, figuring out what the argument is, beating it out. And then once you've done that, you can scaffold jokes on top of it. Now, while right, you're doing right. it, you look for, okay, what's the funny part of the argument? What is the funny part of the information? What is the part that's making us laugh that's already halfway to a joke? You know, once you've got all that laid out, you are turning it into comedy, which turns out to be a little bit more mechanical once you've been doing it for a, a decade or so. Yeah, the mechanical part is fascinating to me because I watch a lot of stand-up and really like it. Like, I'm a, I'm a consumer, right, of comedy. Mm -hmm. I really like it. And I think I find it both... I like it because I like to laugh, but I also just as a presentational mode or genre as someone who communicates for a living and talks for a living, it's interesting to me. When you talk about jokes, it's like there's a whole set of formal mechanisms around jokes yes. that can get you pretty far to a laugh before you get the punchline. Like yes. the pacing and the beat and the delivery and the audience sort of beginning to tense up to know in anticipation of the release they know they're going to get. And so they're then like almost physiologically disposed. Mm -hmm. And all of that stuff, you start to see how structural it is, I guess, for lack of a better yeah. word, or formal when you watch a lot of it. Mm -hmm. I think we think about it in similar ways. A lot of comedians don't think about it in this way that you do it and I do. But yeah, like comedy is... It's all these little moves that you make. Most of it is playing with the audience's attention and their expectation. And so, right. yes, the thing you've identified where the audience laughs before they get to the punchline because they're sort of getting halfway there themselves is like one of my most delicious things to do as a comic because now we're all enjoying it together, yeah. right? That's like a, yeah. a really wonderful structural move. But, you know, the thing for me is like I've, you know, I've devoted decades of my life to learning how to do that piece of it. And I love that piece of it. And I love focusing on it. But also, you know, my critique of comedy is a lot of it is not actually about anything. <laughs> you know, a lot of comedians yeah, don't right. actually have something to say. Or, you know, the, the thing people make fun of comedians for saying is like, we're the truth tellers, we're the philosophers of the modern day. And then they go on to repeat the most boring common wisdom you have ever heard, right? right? Of like, <laughs> exactly. oh, in the old days, we were tougher because, you know, we got bullied. <laughs> Stuff like yeah. that. I'm like, you yeah, can go right. to any yeah, street right. corner and <laughs> find a guy saying that, right? Yes. You're not saying Correct. anything interesting. Yes. Yeah. Be like, oh, you like and approve of the traditional gender d dynamics? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Wow. <laughs> and look, that's what some people want in their comedy, right? But that's not what I do. What, what I really seek to do is to use comedy to find, to surface and bring to the audience genuinely new ideas that they have not heard before. You know, when I do informational comedy, I'm trying to like, you know, delve right. deep and find the really deep nuggets like recent research, unexplored perspectives that are actually going to be novel to them and then make them come to life through comedy. That is, in fact, the hard part. The comedy I can sort of do, it's, you know, muscle, whatever, fast twitch muscle fibers. It's like built into my nervous system at this point uh, on a good day. So then let's talk about this project. First, I want to start with a backstory of how it came to be, uh, which is a fun backstory. Yeah. And then talk about, I got to say, you really pull it off. And it, I, for people that- Thank you. Again, this is something that I've thought about. I've thought about like how would I, would, if I wanted to do a doc series, if I was going to host something and what would it be about? And what would like, it's way easier to go from like some nub of an idea to a thing that actually works that people want to watch. But talk about the origin of the G word. Like how did it come about? Sure. It's a funny story. I mean, I had read Michael Lewis's The Fifth Risk in 2018, around when it came out. I thought it was an incredible book. And there were a bunch of stories in it about how the federal government works that really, I was like, my God, I would love to do these on television someday. You know, the story of, of how 
you know, the National Weather Service underpins, you know, our entire society in these ways. We, you know, planes could not take off if not for the National Weather Service, much less, you know, you wouldn't be able to get a single forecast on the nightly news and how, you know, the private weather company AccuWeather is undermining, you know, the National Weather Service and trying to, to turn it into a private entity. What a hell of a story. This is a story that I would do on Adam Ruins Everything. Unfortunately, Adam Ruins Everything had come to an end because the AT&T Time Warner merger killed our show as it did uh, many other projects. We were canceled soon after that merger. And so I was looking for new television shows to pitch around the time I read this book. About nine months after I read it, I get a call from my manager and he says, hey, so uh, I don't know if you'd be interested in this. Uh, Barack and Michelle Obama's company have optioned this book, The Fifth Risk. They would like to make a TV show about it, but they don't have an idea. (laughs) That's all that they know. They want to know if you want to come in and pitch on it. And I said, well, yes, indeed I would, uh, because I love that book and I have a good idea for it. So we went in and pitched it to Higher Ground first, then into Netflix, and they bought it. And, you know, we, it was a long road getting the show coming out because COVID happened in the middle of our writing process and set us back a lot. But uh, those are the broad strokes. So I think... (laughs) <laughs> this is probably of interest to like a very small set of people, but I am one of those people and it's my podcast, so I'll ask you. What, what was the- <laughs> <laughs> Those are the best questions. Those are the best questions. Like, what was the pitch? Yeah, you don't do the pitch for me, but I just pitched a show that's a fiction, a drama show. So I, and I had never done that before. I found that process fascinating because it was mm-hmm. new and I'd never done it before. But what was the pitch? Because it's a tough, I mean, you're already halfway there, right? They've optioned the book, they want something on it. But it's like, we're going to do what? like go around and talk to people in the government and make jokes? Like, like you got to have something more refined than that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's about, first of all, the incredible stories that are lurking just beneath the surface of our daily lives, right? That, that our lives are in fact held up by this invisible scaffolding and there's all these stories underneath that we're going to pull out and show to the audience. That's part of it. That's sort of like the candy part of it. And then the vegetables part of it is that, you know, we live in a time when people have, lost faith in their government, and they treat their government like they have a relationship of consumers to their government, where they they want the government to provide them with services, and they're angry when they don't receive it. And we've lost sight of it as a common project that we are all engaged in as a society. And somewhat with good reason, because of the way that the, you know, the government has been deliberately eroded by forces working within it and outside of it yeah. to reduce that faith. And so, you know, we we positioned the show as somewhat of a, of a tonic to that, to try to you know, illuminate for people all the incredible things that the government does that affect our lives, both good and bad. Very important that we we are as critical as much as we are complimentary uh, about government ineffectiveness and inaction and, and just ways in which it is harmful and deadly. But then also, yeah, the piece where we go meet the on-the-ground workers who make the government function. Not the heads of the departments who you see on, right. you know, the Sunday shows, but you know, the people who work for the government day to day. So, you know, a big part of the pitch, I like to give a flashbulb moment. You know, we are going to go to a meat processing facility and see the USDA workers who are standing there on the line every single day, touching the meat with their hands. Picking up the meat, like- uh, Picking up the meat, looking at it. And those workers have a big red button. They can stop the line at any moment. But if they do, everyone in the plant's gonna be mad at them because the people, they they work right next to the people who work for the company, right? What an interesting position to be in. That's a, you know, that's a working class job that, you know, still has an important mission behind it. And we're gonna meet the folks who, this is the part that sold Netflix, I think, literally fly planes through hurricanes in order to figure out where the hurricane is going so we can protect everybody's lives in Florida or Louisiana. That was an essential part of our pitch. So now look, at the end of the day, if I had gone in to pitch this idea to Netflix and I didn't have Barack Obama, who, (laughs) who, by the way, Netflix is already into for like $100 million, right? They have a giant deal with him. Yeah, they got a big deal, yep. So when Barack Obama says, hey, a show I want to make is this show, and they're like, well, we've already given you a bunch of money. Like, it's kind of hard for us to say no now. If I had gone in without all of that, would this show have gotten made in today's, you know, capitalist media ecosystem? I have a hard time thinking it would be as easy as sell. But, you know, all those things together, that helped make it happen. Uh, Barack Obama appears in it. Yes, he does. Yeah. Had you met him before that? No, never. I mean, we uh, did not uh, speak with him until we had started working on the show. We'll be right back after we take this quick break. So 
Let's talk about the USDA example, which yeah. is a great one and a great, people should watch it. You know, this is almost a cliche, right? Which is that like, you know, people don't really want to know what goes on on the inside of a meatpacking plant for a whole bunch of reasons. Yeah, you don't want to know how the sausage is made, right? Exactly. Like, you you know, obviously, you know, this has been the sort of like very early and, and profound example of what the government should regulate, you know, the dangers of unregulated markets, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, which was a sort of investigative a look at how meatpacking was functioning in an unregulated marketplace. The fact that every piece of meat you buy says USDA, whatever, on it. You seem a little tra- traumatized by it, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which I, I think mean, I would be as well. But tell us just how that came about and walk us through what you learned there. So one of the very first things we knew we wanted to do on the show, like I said, it was in our pitch, was to go into a meat plant. We also knew that it would be incredibly difficult. I mean, they have not allowed cameras in these facilities for decades, ever since, you know, PETA started, you know, sneaking in and and filming this footage and releasing it as part of their own activism. And we were working on it for three years and it was the last thing that we shot. So there was a moment where we had every other piece of the show in the can and we were like, ooh, except for the the very first most important field piece in the entire show. The first sentence of our pitch. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And the other last thing to shoot was the hurricane plane segment because we had to wait for a hurricane and we had to have just the right Right. window, you know, that that the Air Force could bring us up. But we did finally get access with the help of our wonderful field producing team and- You know, it was a really intense environment. I mean, first of all, it's a factory. It's a working factory. Um, We went to a Cargill beef processing facility in Schuyler, Nebraska. And it is a, uh, it's a working factory. There's, you know, hundreds of people working there. It's cinder block walls. It's loud. It is, you know, sort of all consuming. And then when we actually entered the floor where the meat is inspected, it was one of the most intense places I've ever been. It's like there's humidity in the air from, you know, what is being done there, right? The smell is overpowering. The sound is overpowering. It's the sound of these gigantic, it's almost the kind of sound design that would be in a movie about a sort of horrifying factory. It's sort of like these pneumatic sounds of goosh. Yeah. You know? And it was utterly overwhelming. And this is a facility where the cows come in and they are slaughtered and they are butchered and the packaged meat goes out the other end. This is, everything is happening in this one facility. And, you know, we show you most of that. We don't show you the moment at which uh, the cows are slaughtered because we didn't feel that it was appropriate to do so. But we certainly paint the picture and you can imagine what's happening in the middle, right? And, uh, you know, we had this conversation with the veterinarians who work there, with the inspectors who work on the line. And, you know, they explain that, yeah, this is, you know, they look at every single piece of meat to make sure that it is not diseased. And they make sure that the cows are not diseased on the way in. And I had a really difficult conversation, interesting conversation with one of the veterinarians who said, you know, he used to be a small animal vet. He was a literal, you know, my dog is sick. Let me bring my dog to the vet. He was that kind of vet. Now he works for USDA. And how does he feel about the fact that he's now a part of a system that, you know, kills animals and abuses animals on a massive scale? And he said, well, I do love the animals, but I I do think it's important that someone be here to make sure that this system isn't as bad as it could be. And you can see on on the tape, I kind of go, yeah, okay. I agree with that. I still have my qualms, you know. And we go on, by the way, you know, to have a, a lot of criticism of, of the USDA and its its coziness with big agriculture and prioritization of the needs of farmers or the needs of eaters. Uh, there's various proposals out to reduce the number of, of inspectors on the line, which is something that the industry is pushing for, but isn't in the public interest. You know, we, we give what I hope is a very well-rounded view of this very difficult, complex system. But we also point out if it weren't for the government's intervention here, it would be much, much worse. And sort of part of the theme there is to paint the picture for the audience that, look, because of diseased meat back in Teddy Roosevelt's day, we sent, people were dying at a a huge rate of, you know, infected meat. We said, we're going to send inspectors from the government on the line. They have to be there for the plant to operate every single day. That's a massive intervention by today's standards. We did it. It worked. We no longer die at enormous rates of these. Now, the system could be better, could always be improved, and we need to guard against it being rolled back. But look at what we did 
So imagine if we were to do that again in all these different areas. We're trying to w- raise the our belief in what the government can do again. Yeah, and I thought it was interesting, your interviews with the folks. That, like, it's also just a fascinating, like, the co-location of it all, right? Yeah. It's not like you're the building inspector and you're going to, you, you get in your car or get on the subway and you show up at the building and then you inspect it and you go back to your office. Like, yeah, that's your workplace. That's where you yeah. are all the time, which just at a social, institutional, psychological level is really intense. Yeah. Particularly compounded by the intensity of that atmosphere, which really is like, whew. Yeah. I mean, look, one of the things that gave me the idea for this piece, just to shout this guy out, there's a wonderful immersive journalist named Ted Conover. We are not related, just so you know, or maybe very distantly. He does... Uh, in a wonderful form of journalism where he immerses himself in a particular profession and then writes about it. And he, so he he worked as, as a prison guard at Sing Sing for three yep. years and wrote yep. an incredible book called New Jack about that. So he wrote, a, he, wrote, he wrote a piece for Harper's a number of years ago called The Way of All Flesh, in which he worked as a one of these workers and just described the experience of, you know, being a meat inspector, but sharing a break room with everybody else, you know, or sharing a workplace and knowing that when you have to hit that stop button, that f- up everybody else's day, people in your same community who you care about. And that wasn't something that we were able to get into in the show, but it's like a a wild part of that job that, yeah, I mean, these are folks, they live in the same town. You know, this is a town where everybody at the town works at this plant. It's amazing how company town does. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that happened during COVID, right, was like, and we had these outbreaks and you would see these like population density maps and there'd be these little population dense pinpricks in Nebraska. Yeah. It's like, what's that? It's like, oh, right, that's the meatpacking plant. Like, the, there's, yeah. you know, there's it's completely rural, and then there's like 5,000 people in this small place that are making this meatpacking plant run. Yeah, and, you know, one of the stories from early in the pandemic was there were the, some of the, there were huge early outbreaks in some of yep. those meat factories, and a lot of them were USDA workers. A lot of USDA workers got COVID and died very early because they were classified as essential workers, and this is a cold environment where people are clustered together. It was just like a recipe. Yelling, too. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yelling over the machinery. It's an incredibly dangerous place to work, and it's one of those jobs where you're like, you know, before you take a bite of your burrito, like say a prayer of thanks to the, to the the inspector totally. who's there, like looking at the meat that you just ate. All right, let's talk about the National Weather Service. Yes, which is another part of the show and the hurricane part of it, but more broadly, like <laughs> so lame. I finally bought an Apple Watch. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I was like holding out, and then I was like, oh, whatever. It's, anyway. I have an Apple Watch. And I don't think people realize that, like, when you get the little, like, oh, here's what the forecast is. Here's what the, like, it's all basically coming from them. Yeah. Like, all of it. Like, everything, everything you know about the weather, essentially, yeah, is downstream of the government. Yes, it quite literally is. I mean, we have a little fun on the show and make fun of like local weather people, right? Who many of whom are accomplished meteorologists. Yeah, it's a funny bit. Yeah. And by the way, we rankled a couple of, you know, television meteorologists who are like, hey, we're not just stuffed shirts. We actually are, you know, we know something about the weather, which many of them do, but many are just reading a forecast, right? Let's be honest. There's a lot of right, yeah, folks yeah. who are weather casters rather than meteorologists. You know, they are certainly not running a network of hundreds of, of weather observation posts staffed by thousands of meteorologists meteorologists, satellites across the country, they're getting all of that data from the National Weather Service, which provides it to everyone for free. You can go to weather.gov and you can see the exact same weather products that your local meteorologist gets if you're a weather geek. And, you know, countless businesses are built on the back of this public service. And not just businesses, it's, you know, people at sea, right? Air traffic controllers, the reason it's provided by the federal government is it's a public good that only the government can provide. We simply cannot rely on a single private business to do this. And that's where all of the data is coming from. But as we talk about on the show, private weather businesses like AccuWeather that have built their businesses on that data, AccuWeather in particular has started to see the National Weather Service as competition. And for the past decades, they have been working to undermine the National Weather Service. And as Michael Lewis writes about in in that book, You know, Barry Myers, the head of AccuWeather, advocated to get himself appointed to be the head of NOAA. He was not appointed, but he has been on, you know, National Weather Service boards. He was able to block them from developing their own app. And so if you look at, you know, I draw this comparison a lot. If you look at NASA 
go to nasa.gov. You will see the most beautiful website you've ever seen, right? Because NASA gets a marketing budget because NASA historically was partially a public relations exercise, right? Yeah. And so the government has given NASA enough money in order to tell its story. The National Weather Service has been prevented from telling its story to the public. You go to the National Weather Service, you'll see, go to weather.gov, you'll see a lot of wonderful data. You won't see a slick website that's like, is going to appeal to weather geeks like, you know, the, the Weather Channel has, right? And I think that's a failure because the Weather Service is, is incredible. Like, as soon as you learn about it, you can't help but geek out over how cool it is. And that's left an opening for bad actors to try to pervert the system to, for their profit rather than the public good because we don't know enough to protect it. So how'd you get into the hurricane? Again, this is a logistical question, but that seems yeah. like a, just from a field production standpoint, that seems a tough, a heavy lift. It was about two years of work to go up in a hurricane plane. And here's the thing. Every time, just to give people a little context, every single time that there is a hurricane approaching the Atlantic coast or the South coast, there are multiple teams of U.S. government workers flying planes through that hurricane. They take off, they fly directly through the center of the hurricane. Then they make a cloverleaf pattern. They go back through it four or five times. Then they land. Another plane takes off and does the same thing continuously, basically throughout hurricane season. And the reason they do this is that getting direct measurement of the hurricane is the only way you can figure out where the hurricane is, what the wind speeds are, et cetera. You can learn some amount through satellite and radar, but you can't, you know, they literally try to get a fix of the center point of the hurricane. And they do that by measuring the wind speeds. And there's a navigator a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. Okay we found the center. And then that's how they update the hurricane's motion. And that's how they know when it's going to hit the coast. Right. So just so everyone knows, like everything, again, to hammer this point home, every time there's a hurricane approaching, every yeah. single map you see, every single display, all of the coverage of it on my network, on the weather, on every network, all of it, 100% is because of those flights identifying that data. That is Correct. the way that we know where it is. Yeah. And they've been doing it since the 40s, right? Nobody or... Uh, uh, somewhere around there. Nobody else is doing them. So those flights are done by two agencies, by NOAA, which is a civilian agency, but they have this NOAA commissioned officers corps where they they're uniformed and they're, they're like specific pilots, the very cool agency. And then the Air Force does it as well. And we at first tried to go up with NOAA, but they had extremely strict COVID restrictions because they have so few pilots. It's like a very, very elite sort of small group that they couldn't afford any risk of infection. So we ended up going with the Air Force. And it was a matter of, you know, hey, here's hurricane season. Here's when we hope we're going to be flying a mission and we hope that we'll have seats available for you. And you're going to, you know, we'll, 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 you'll have 48 hours notice that you're going to have to fly down to one of these airports to get on one of the planes. So we did it once. We flew out of Florida. We went up and it turns out the hurricane didn't form. We like went with them on a mission. <laughs> But the mission was just flying around the Atlantic into a thing that was not quite yet a hurricane for like eight hours. We got very nauseated. It was pretty good footage, but we yeah. were like, for the show, we were like, we need to fly through an actual hurricane. We need to do it again. And so we then had to ask them, please let us know about the next hurricane. And they said, okay, a couple of weeks later, they're like, all right, we got another one. We're flying out of St. Croix, which is one of the U.S. Virgin Islands. Flew down there with no notice, put a team together. Our incredible producing team really like killed themselves getting us there and flew up again and went through Hurricane Sam, which is a, a hurricane that in 2021, it never made landfall, but it was a named hurricane that sort of went up and, you know, to the Northeast through the Atlantic. It was an incredible experience, really nauseating, uh, very uncomfortable. Imagine a cargo plane, but it's just outfitted with scientific equipment. Yeah. So there's no seats. There's like jump seats you strap yourself into, but you know, you're not sitting, there's no, there's no bottled water, right? You have to bring your own food. You're sort of walking around. There's trip hazards everywhere. It's, it's more like being on a boat than being on a plane. And it's constantly shaking. There's enormous turbulence. But then, you know, as you see on the show, there's this moment where you break through the eye of the hurricane. Yeah. And it's astonishing. I mean, suddenly you've been in clouds for hours. You've been in, you know, gray out conditions. Suddenly the sun is shining down from the sky. The ocean is below you. You can see all the way from the top to the bottom. And then ahead of you, a mile ahead, you see this mile high wall of clouds that is just, you know, towering in front of you. And it was mind blowing. It was like a once in a life. It was like going to the moon or something, or <laughs> or going to the the Marianas Trench. It's like one of the most powerful, you know, physical forces, natural forces on Earth. And these guys fly into this every day. 
It was unbelievable. Talk a little bit about the GPS as well, because that was something, I, the weather service I knew about because of the Michael Lewis book. I did not realize the degree to which GPS is somewhat similar in terms of being a fully government run and backed backbone that everything else operates off of. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I was in the same boat. When we started the show, I had read Michael Lewis's book. I knew about the National Weather Service a bit. My dad's a marine biologist. I had heard of the National Weather Service in my life, right? But I asked my staff, hey, what else does the government do that most people aren't aware of? And when one of my researchers, a man named Sam Raudman, brought in the story, okay, did you know that the government invented and currently runs the entire GPS network for the entire world? Literally go anywhere in the world and use any GPS device, whether that's a Garmin or a Apple Watch or a cell phone or a car with GPS. Every single one of them is using U.S. government satellites for free that are a public service for the entire world. And I was like, how did I not know this? Like, how is this a story that we have failed to tell? Like, we, you know, we all believe that, I don't know, Google, Garmin, TomTom, one of these companies did it. It's the U.S. government that did it all along. And it took them like 50 years of research to do. It's an unbelievable story. Right. I always thought it was one of those like, you know, DARPA stories of it had been developed mm -hmm. through government research. And then at some point, right. it had sort of been handed off or someone else was running it. But I didn't realize like, and also that for the whole world. Yeah. That was the other thing yeah. that blew my mind. Yeah. Well, uh, my understanding is that the reason that works is because the satellites are just constantly transmitting right? It's not like a cell right. phone tower where you send data to them and they send it back to you. They're just sort of going, here I am, here I am, here I am, here I am, here I am all the time. And so it's like a lighthouse, right? If you have a GPS device, you can access that signal at any time. And other countries now, China and Russia, are starting to develop their own GPS networks because they don't love relying on a U.S. government public service in their own countries. But like, the entire concept for GPS, the implementation of it, and then the development of the chips, you know, of the tiny GPS receivers was all led by the government. And so, yes, there's many other examples like DARPA, you know, of the, you know, the, DARPA funded the initial research that led to the development of the computer mouse and the internet and all these things. But ultimately, they're public-private partnerships, right? Right. But the GPS is a public-public partnership. It's just the, it's just a public service that we are running. And, we go to the room that, you know, where the GPS service is run from, where, you know, 10 folks who now work for the Space it's Force. 10 people. 10 people. Used to be the Air Force. Now it's under the Space Force. Um, They're called Guardians. 10 Guardians. Space Force Guardians. You know, and by the way, I, I, I had as much fun making fun of the sports, Space Force as anybody. When you go actually meet them, you're like, okay, I like you guys. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Yeah, yeah. No, totally. No, I, I got no beef with the, the people in the Space Force. My beef was with the bizarre and ludicrous trajectory of a man-child becoming president and yes. focusing on making his seven-year-old dreams come true. <laughs> Absolutely. But that was that was long in the works, you know? And, and everyone I talked to there right. said, you know, I asked a couple of people, I was like, is there a good organizational research reason for making a distinction between the Air Force and the Space Force? And everyone I spoke to was like, oh, yes, yes, for such and such a reason, it's a very good idea. So, like, whatever, I'm not going to argue right. with those people. In any case, right. there's 10 people in a room making these, you know, making sure these satellites stay on course, making sure the signal is clear and, you know, basically taking customer service requests from like companies that, you know, rely on, uh, rely on the GPS service and, you know, military uh, folks who are using it. And if the U.S. government wasn't doing that, the entire system would go down and everyone's GPS devices would stop working in an instant. And that is like, a true piece of like essential scaffolding in modern life. And GPS is one of the most, by the way, transformative innovations of the modern age. Like it's up there with the internet. Absolutely. The fact that, I mean, how much does, yes. how much does a GPS receiver cost? Like probably a nickel at this point. And, you know, you can put it in any single device. It can tell you where you are anywhere on the planet, like within a fraction of a meter. Like what the hell? This is, it's, yeah. <laughs> what could be bigger than that? It still feels like magic to yeah. me, honestly. Even, uh, you know, I'm old enough that, I remember printing out directions. Yeah, no, I, you know, I did too, yeah. And driving, and, and it still feels like magic to me. I mean, I guess the question is like, what is the theory behind when government works and when it doesn't? Like, why is it good at some things and bad at others? Yeah. What are places where it provides services really smoothly and other places where it it doesn't do that? I'm curious how your ideas about that at a broader theoretical level develop through this process. Absolutely. I mean... So one of the things that made concluding this show very difficult is that 
you really can't come up with a single theory of government once you are looking at it on the level we are, right? right. This show is anti-cynicism, but it's not uncritical, right? Like we go through for right. every single one of the positive stories I just told you, we tell a negative story about the National Weather Service is incredible. FEMA is a structural embarrassment that results in the deaths of thousands of Americans every hurricane season. Right. You know, the, the USDA has been in bed with the agriculture industry with ruinous effects on our health. DARPA, which, you know, helped create the GPS system, is responsible for the deaths of countless civilians because they invented Agent Orange, you know? Yeah. So th these are, uh, half of our show is dedicated to those examples. Yeah. Right? Your show's position is GPS good, Agent Orange bad. That's your hot take. <laughs> it's a little bit more complex. Than, I mean, uh, yes, but <laughs> except that, look, we have GPS because... DARPA and uh, DARPA is a military research agency. It's the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. All these things were invented. GPS was invented to help target missiles. Like that's <laughs> that's what it's for. And then right. they figured out, oh, we can open this up to civilian use and that's going to be great, you know? But a persistent pattern in our government is that we invest in research that helps us kill people. Literally, that's why we know the structure of the atom is because the U.S. government wanted to build a giant bomb, you know? And, and we have decades of high energy physics as a result of that decision that also led to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people at, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yeah. And so we have to grapple with that duality. And so a question that we ask at the end of that episode, which is called the future, why do we always imagine a future that is, you know, where we have bigger blastier weapons, where we're killing each other in more efficient ways? Why is that what the government's research power is put towards rather than just saying, hey, how can we fix housing, right? <laughs> how good with, by, by, right. You know, with better research, et cetera. Why don't we invest re resources there? We're trying to give a more complicated view than this good, this bad, or government good, government bad. What we do identify are that there are services that the government provides that cannot be provided any other way, such as true public goods. True public goods can only be provided by an entity that serves at the pleasure of the public and that, you know, whose incentives come from public support or lack of public support. That's one thing the government does. We also talk about in our money episode about how the government is in charge of how much money there is, <laughs> right? And so fundamentally, when you have a, a crisis like the COVID-19 shutdown or, or any other similarly sized economic crisis, only the government can step in. It's literally the only- right organization. They don't, like Goldman Sachs can't do it. Like only the government can right, do it. Right? right. And only the government can make sure that those who don't have power, those who don't have resources are adequately cared for. That's another piece of the public. Only the government can ensure that, you know, we talk about, for instance, in uh, medical research that the NIH, uh, the National Institutes of Health is responsible for most of our greatest medical research advancements, and they research things that nobody else will. For instance, they're on the verge of curing sickle cell disease, which is a disease that, you know, predominantly affects African Americans. And, you know, Pfizer's not working on that because there's no money in it. Right. Only the National Institutes of Health could. And so we make the case that these are needs that only the government can provide. Now, the government still f***s up at providing them a lot of the time. For instance, the government creates all of this money, right, out of thin air and injects it into the economy to make sure that people, you know, the economy doesn't grind to a halt and people are able to pay their bills. But that money didn't end up in the hands of the people who need it the most. You know, uh, we talk about, I, I interview, uh, I mean, you've seen the show, but I, right. you know, I interview uh, these two women who run a daycare who received a total of $6,000 in government aid and their daycare, which is a truly essential service working, you know, for underserved folks in, in South LA, uh, their daycare had to close. My production company, which, you know, just makes television shows, received more PPP loans than that. That's a failure right. of the government to, you know, make sure that they got what they needed. Why did we get more? Because that's the way of the world. We have a fancier accountant at a bigger bank, right? So we're able right. to, we have more, so we get more. That unfortunately is how capitalism works in the absence of government intervention. The government's job is to say, no, 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 no. We're gonna, we're gonna change that dynamic and we're gonna make sure that those who need what, you know, the public that needs these services gets them. It doesn't always succeed at that. And there are many forces arrayed to stop it from doing that. And that's why we have to be eternally vigilant to make sure that we are always pulling the government back towards what it's supposed to be doing. We need to be pulling it towards National Weather Service and fixing FEMA. The FDIC is a wonderful example of a service that serves everybody, including those most financially vulnerable. And we need to be holding up those models and moving away from the ones that fail us. 
More of our conversation after this quick break. What was it like you interviewed Barack Obama? Yeah. I don't know how active he or Michelle were on the project, but just like that seems like it has its own gravity around yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm just curious how you approached and navigated. I'm really glad that you asked. Yeah. My biggest concern about taking on the project was this is a show about the United States government. Barack Obama is an executive producer of the show, right? Is there a conflict at the center of this show? But I looked at it much the same way as I did when I was on True TV, advertising supported television, and I was making television that, you know, is advertising supported. I'm I'm criticizing advertising. So it it was a matter of carving out a a creative space on the show that would allow us to do an investigation with integrity that, you know, was not going to be seen or was actually going to be, you know, a mouthpiece for Obama's political views. So So one of the ways that we approached it was I made it very clear to them at the beginning that we needed editorial independence and that we needed to follow the stories, you know, that came out of our research room and that it had to be my perspective, not his. And as a result, we do, they granted us that and stuck to it, although we did have to remind them on occasion, hey, remember, this this is the agreement that we're making. So, you know, et cetera, we're not going to take that note, thank you, but, you know, et cetera. And as a result, we did a lot of segments that, you know, Barack Obama would not himself have done on the show. We talk about the incredible increase in drone strikes under his administration. We talk about the concession that the Affordable Care Act made to, you know, the sort of, you know, neoliberal need to compromise with the market rather than actually put in place a, a muscular government solution, that sort of thing. So we did those. But then the other thing I knew we needed to do was to let the audience know that this is the conditions under which the show is being made. So if we were to just make the show and then people would see on the credits, well, hold on a second, executive produced by Barack Obama, something shady is going on here. So instead we did an opening scene in which I and him openly, you know, are transparent about it, yeah. openly <laughs> discuss the conditions under which the show is being made, whether or not I say, people yep. are going to think this is pro-government propaganda. And he says, okay, well, leave me out of it. You go do whatever the hell you want, you know? Your funeral, go have right. fun. Which really works and was a good idea, by the Thank way. Thank you. That's my note. <laughs> I appreciate it. You want a note from me. (laughs) Look, I'm very happy to hear it because I spent three years sweating over that sequence, right? And making sure that it was doing what we wanted it to do. But then as we worked on the show, over the course of it, you know, we were writing the show during the protests after George Floyd's murder, right? And we were sitting there going, I started thinking, hold on a second. I've spent my career raising awareness of issues like this. How the hell do we go about changing the government, right? I'm complaining about FEMA. I'm complaining about criminal justice, right? How do we, what the hell do we do about it? And decided we we needed, we threw out an entire script and said, we need to do an entire finale that answers that question or attempts to answer that question. And I realized one of the best ways to do that would be to frankly confront Barack Obama about it because his election for me You know, I was in my 20s in 2008. It was a big part of my own political awakening. You know, I was not particularly engaged before his election. And, you know, it was all right. We're going to see change. You know, this is what we're voting for. And I am one of those voters who, you know, eight years later was like, I didn't quite see the change I wanted to. I'm not sure I feel optimistic about the direction of the country right now. And I read his book, for example. There's a degree to which Mm -hmm. his own account of why he made the decisions that he made at the time that he made them doesn't match the rhetoric that he that he ran on, especially in that first election, right? And I wanted to, you know, if, if only for myself, have that conversation with him, right? And say, well, you know, your election was the greatest movement for political change I have seen in my lifetime on a national level. And yet, right, what we didn't see the change that we expected. And so how do we grapple with that, you know? And what do we do about it? And where do we go from here? And, you know, I'm really happy that he was able to have that conversation with me. A big part of my goal was, you know, he's he's an incredible speaker and you can almost you've heard him speak for your entire life. And you can almost imagine if if you were to ask him any question, what his answer would be. You, you've heard him say the same things over mm-hmm. and over again. Yes. And yes. I was like, I, yep. I need to get him off of that rut a little bit. I need to give him a shove. Yes. And I need to get to a different place. And in a very short period of time, we talked for an hour, but you know, the, the interview is seven minutes edited. Right. And I'm happy that I think we were able to do that and sort of get to a little bit more of a complicated, interesting spot and have a real conversation. I definitely annoyed him a little bit, <laughs> which is part of my goal. And uh, was able to have a real conversation about this stuff. And that ends up being the kickoff moment to our exploration of 
criminal justice reform, why it has stalled in America, and what it's, you know, if we want to make a difference in it, how we can actually do that, which ends up being organizing politically on a local level rather than on a national one, is ends up being our big, our big call to action at the end. What is your vibe right now or feeling <laughs> about things? Like, I feel, I, I am really finding myself battling dark, pessimistic mm-hmm. thoughts. I'm, I'm a person who has, who's generally both has a combination of, I have generally anxiety, but I'm pretty optimistic. I'm a pretty upbeat person. Yeah. I'm a pretty happy person. I'm not a particularly tortured person. And so it's been a tough yeah. period. <laughs> and I'm just curious where you're, like having made this, now having launched it out into the world, and I found it like a really, like there was this piece in the New York Times the other day you might have seen which is about Houston and homelessness, mm-hmm. where they just went through how the city had basically found homes for about 25,000 folks yeah. who had been homeless and how they gone about doing it and how it, it worked. Is it perfect? No. It, you know, yeah. there are problems. And it was one of these things which just like, I needed to read that at that time yeah. because I was just having, I was caught in this like, it's very hard to fix things. Nothing can improve. And, and just, so I find, and I found your show that way too. Like, I think it's a good time to release this out into the world, but I wonder where your head is at about these things. I mean, that final episode is where my head is at. It was me trying to grapple with these questions, you know, about, you know, mass incarceration, criminal justice reform, two issues that are really important to me. And it, it often feels so one step forward, you know, two steps back when we're tackling them. But the more involved I get in local politics here in Los Angeles, honestly, the more optimistic that I become. Because the truth is that, yeah, the national situation is incredibly bleak. The political fundamentals are incredibly bad in all kinds of countless ways that you talk about every week. We don't need to get into uh, on this show. But the fact is there's a huge potential for change to be made locally. And one of the things we talk about on the show is if you care about criminal justice reform, then your your local city or county district attorney is by far the most important job, right? Yeah. And that is a job that you can, you know, organize to flip if you are interested in, in that seat. Or if yep. homelessness is your issue, that's something that you can build around. And so the reason we made that is that's what I've been doing over the last couple of years. In 2020, I basically tapped out of the national election because I was really disheartened by it. I I followed it, obviously. But instead, I organized and campaigned for a local city council candidate for the council district I live in, CD4, for a woman named Nithya Rahman, who was running on a platform of not just, you know, hey, I want to change our district, but like, I want to literally inform the citizens of what a city council person does and what is possible and just like prove that this is something worth caring about. And she mobilized a huge number of people in Los Angeles. And she ended up winning. She beat an entrenched incumbent opponent who had, you know, the support of everybody in the political establishment. And she won by knocking on doors and by inspiring people and by being honest and truthful about what she wanted to do. And now, two years later, there's a whole crop of new people who are running in Los Angeles. And I'll be honest, we just had our primary election here, as did so many others. And honestly, I was at first really worried about that election. You know, on that election night, I was really down about it because, you know, Chase Boudin was recalled in San Francisco. And, you know, here's the problem. Every time one, every time we elect one of these progressive prosecutors who wants to, you know, not throw 16-year-olds in prison for life for having an ounce of weed in their pocket, right, the entire society mobilizes against them and say, oh, they're abetting crime yeah. and they're doing X, Y, Z. And we don't need to get into the nitty gritty of like Chase Boudin could have done X, Y, Z better or Larry Krasner could have done X, Y, Z better in, in Philadelphia. Um, the, the point is we need Need these changes to be made. And, you know, the, the counter organizing against them is immense. And so that made me kind of disheartened. But the longer it's been since that election day in LA and in California, the better the news has gotten because there's progressive DAs yes. <laughs> in other counties in California who are doing quite well. The wave has, we have one counter example, but the wave has not yet crested. And we are looking at, we just had new ballots come in because they're coming in over the course of many weeks here in LA. We just had new ballots come in and it's looking like a progressive sweep in Los Angeles. Like literally a, a woman named Eonisa Hernandez who is running in CD1 here, who, because there's only two candidates, she's not going to a runoff. So the primary is like do or die. That's the whole election. And she just pulled out ahead, impossibly. Like it, it was honestly a very, very long shot. She pulled out ahead. Hugo Soto Martinez is running in CD13 is is ahead. The progressive uh, candidate for city attorney is ahead. Uh, Karen Bass has pulled against ahead of of Caruso. I was incredibly worried about Caruso's candidacy because- Yes, I I was seeing your posts about him. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I, I mean, it looked like 
hey, this guy is running on law and order. He's running as the reincarnation of Ronald Reagan. You know, this could really work and it hasn't. And that has made me really positive that where, you know, I, I had a moment where I was like, wait, is knocking on doors, is mobilizing people, is being full-throated about progressive policies that work actually going to make a difference? Or is it going to be overrun by the tough on crime backlash? backlash. The yeah. same thing that killed the civil rights movement and the Vietnam, you know, war yeah. protests in the, in the you know, 60s and 70s. And so far here in LA, we have seen that no, the appetite for change, for progressive change is continuing and it's really working. And here's what I try to tell people. It's extremely easy to feel pessimistic when you are sitting at home scrolling on Twitter or, no offense, watching MSNBC, Correct. right? Because you are yep. in a situation where you are powerless. But when you start organizing locally, if you find something you can show up to, if you if you start participating in your union, if you find a local branch of your local party to show up to, right? Like, find a committee to join and you start meeting people on that committee and you start being one of the people who shows up every week or even every month and they say, oh, Chris is there every week. Hey, Chris, you know, I know you care about this. I like what you have to say. Do you want to help me organize this thing we got next week? Do you want to go knock on some doors? Do you want to, you know, do a fundraiser? Yep. And you're like, okay, yes, I do want to do that. Pretty soon you're going to be too busy to be pessimistic because you'll have yep. too much to do. And that's the position I found myself in. I'm like literally fielding calls about, you know, you import, I'm on like the board of my union now. I'm like, you know, putting together fundraisers, uh, doing all these things. And, you know, on the one hand, maybe that, in my darkest moment, I'm like, maybe this represents a retreat for people who think that I do. Instead <laughs> of working nationally, we have to work locally. We're going to let the U.S. get balkanized. No, I don't. But on the other hand, this is this is all I can do, you know? I tell people the exact same thing. And I think like, Ultimately, that's what democracy is. Like, you you know, you start with, like, speed bump on the road and, uh, you know, on your, on your block because the cars are going too fast or, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. You know, you you elect people, they represent you. You want, you know, certain things. You want certain priorities. You want certain values embedded. You want tangible material things. I 100% agree with that. I, I tell people things, very similar things, particularly when I meet viewers of ours who are caught yeah. in that kind of paralysis. And, and the way, by the way, that the right wing has advanced its objectives is the same way. I mean, on national issues, yep. you know, guns, the thing that people misunderstand about the NRA is it's not that they have billions of dollars. They do have, they do donate a lot of money. Sure. No, it helps. That's not what it they is. They are organized. They're an affinity group that is like a church, yep. you know, for the people who yep. care. And they can tell people, hey, show up. You know, uh, they don't even have to tell people to show up. The people want to show up because they are embedded yep. in it. And that simply does not exist for, you know, gun control or for any of these other issues. And like, we need to build those systems. We need to, like, politicians respond to organization more than anything else. Because if they know that people are going to show up if they try something, then, you know, they're, they're going to have to respond to that. So you're doing a comedy tour now? I am. Thank you so much. Oh my God. Chris, music to my ears that you would bring that up. Yes, I'm doing a stand-up comedy tour, uh, my first tour after the pandemic. Adam, we got to move some We got to move some product here, okay? We're not just here <laughs> to futz around. Nothing is more important to me than talking about this. Yeah, I'm <laughs> I'm I'm right after this uh right after this recording, I'm headed to Phoenix, I'm going to Boston, Arlington slash DC, uh, New York, Nashville, going all across the country to, to different clubs. Got a brand new hour of stand up comedy. I'm writing about attention deficit disorder and the attention economy and all of those issues. It's some very personal stuff. And uh, that's awesome. Yeah. I'm writing a book about that. About, about the attention economy? Amazing. Yeah. I just sold a book called The Siren's Call about life in the attention age. Ah. And it's all about it's all about attention. So maybe I could come see you when you're in New York. Adam Conover is this TV host, stand-up comedian, creator and host of The G Word on Netflix. That's out now. It's based on The Fifth Risk by Michael Lewis, who we've had on the podcast. Executive producers of The G Word include, as you just heard, Barack and Michelle Obama. He's also the creator and host of Adam Ruins Everything, which now streams on HBO Max. Got a great podcast called Factually. And this was an absolute delight, Adam. Thank you uh, for your work and thanks for coming on the program. Thank you so much. Can I plug where people can get the tickets to the shows? Please do. AdamConover.net slash tour dates or just AdamConover.net. You can find tickets to all my upcoming shows. Please come see me. I'd love to see you. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. This was an absolute blast. Awesome.
Once again, my great thanks to Adam Conover. We reached out to AccuWeather for comment on their relationship with the National Weather Service, something that he mentioned in the episode uh, for clarity on their mission. We did not hear back as of this recording. Don't forget, it's almost time for our semi-annual mailbag. Send us your comments, questions, thoughts about your favorite WithPod episodes, feedback to withpod at gmail.com or tweet us with the hashtag withpod. Also check us out on TikTok by searching for withpod. Why Is This Happening is presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by Donnie Holloway and Brendan O'Melia, engineered by Bob Mallory, and features music by Eddie Cooper. You can see more of our work, including links to things we mentioned here, by going to nbcnews.com slash why is this happening.